Dean of uh, School of Engineering. Um, he's uh, also a professor at the Department of uh, Electronic Engineering and Computer Science here. Um, prior to this, he was uh, faculty at uh, Georgia Tech, and um, he was also the uh, school chair, um, the School of, uh, of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering, um, and the director of Georgia Tech's Institute uh, for Robotics and Intelligent Machines. Um, Sorry, uh, there's a, um, uh, let me, uh, he got his PhD uh, uh, from uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Um, his work is mostly in uh, uh, control theory and robotics with focus uh, in control and coordination of multi-robot systems. Uh, he uh, is a um, fellow of uh, IEEE and IFAC, a member of the Royal, Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science. Uh, currently the president of IEEE uh, Control Systems Society. He has uh, you can see uh, multiple teaching and research awards uh, in the interest of time. Uh, let me skip the long list. Uh, and uh, uh, please join me all in welcoming uh, Bob Mattis. Thank you, Roy. Uh, can you hear me? I like moving around, so I'd rather not stand over by the, the mic. Are we all good? Good. So I am indeed the Dean of Engineering here at UCI. I've been there for little, almost three years now, and I spend the majority of my time in my office doing Deanish things. But I'm also a researcher, and I'm also a roboticist, so I'm really happy to be here today to talk about my research, which is something I, I care rather deeply about. I'm also extra happy to be here today because just a few weeks ago, I became a, uh, an adjoint appointment professor in computer science. So I am now officially a CS professor also, even if it's 0% uh, of my appointment, but it's still, I am one of you guys now. So <laughs> that, makes, that makes me happy. No, I've always straddled, I mean, this is the joy of robotics, right? That it is, you need to understand a little bit about equations of motion, and then you need to understand a little bit about you know, machine learning and perception. So you can't be only on one side of the field. Typically, you need to be an engineer and a computer scientist, at least in book uh, to really do robotics well, which is why I have always have tried to, even though I am an engineer, reach out as much as I can to, to the CS side. And as Roy said, I am really interested in how do you get large teams of robots to do interesting things together? Uh, and in particular, when each robot has limited information, maybe limited processing and computational power, how do we coordinate activities? So for instance, if you're all kind of nearsighted, you can see your neighbors, but you can't see all of you, how do you form circles or squares or cover areas in effective ways? So geometric type questions. That's, I've spent a big part of my career on distributed algorithms for making teams of robots do things. And by now, as a community, we're, we're pretty good at forming circles and squares with robots. So if you form a circle, that would be great. If I wrote a paper about I know how to make robots form circles, no one would be super impressed anymore because we kind of understand that. But what I have gotten increasingly interested in is why should we form circles in the first place? What's good about circles? What triangles? Where did this geometry come from? And in particular, let's say that I, you know, sitting over in, in engineering hall and I want to know what's going on uh, over in the Donald Brand Hall. So I deploy a bunch of robots that are out there kind of spying on, on Dean Marios. Uh, and I want to know what's going on. And they're going to be out there and they're going to sit, check what's going on around computer science here for, for years, say. Should they form circles? Should they form squares? What should they be doing? It's pretty clear what they should not be doing is moving around a lot and spending all this energy on, on pointless things. So I've gotten very interested in the question of long duration swarm robotics or long duration economy where you're deploying robots over truly long time scales what is different and not different in terms of yeah you have to make the electronics more rugged so that when it rains it doesn't short out but what's different from a behavioral or an algorithmic point of view how should we think differently about teams of robots that are deployed for long periods of time 
So that's long duration autonomy. And that's really the, the theme here. So I want to start, start with uh, short duration autonomy. Uh, so this is my former lab a long time ago, 16 years ago, it seems like. Uh, just show you what, what this would look like. So here we have, uh, in this case, 12 robots. They are being told to form a shape. So we broadcast what letter of the alphabet they should form. Then they have to negotiate amongst themselves who should go where in this assembly and then assemble it. And it's based on, in this case, distances only, which is why all these things are rotationally invariant. Uh, you don't know where it's going to be and uh, how it's going to be rotated. Uh, and we, like I said, understood quite a bit about how to do things like this. Uh, you need enough information. You, we now know kind of what information you need. Uh, we've learned a lot from nature, which is why I have all these pictures of schooling fish or flocking birds. I've actually worked a lot on, on wolf packs. So how do they do collaborative hunting, for instance, also uh, lion frights. Uh, by the way, this is a former student of mine who's now working at Amazon Robotics. Uh, but the point is, the reason I'm calling this short duration autonomy is that there's an awful lot of motion going on. These robots are moving around a lot. And that is not what I should have the robots do if we deploy them you know, by Java City to make sure that I know who is walking in and out of Donald Brand Hall, for instance. Okay. So the question is, if mobility is costly, which it is, it's the most costly thing a robot can do from an energetic point. How do we think differently about what the robots should be doing? So the theme of this talk is really, if we take these robots, say they shouldn't be moving that much. In fact, we're placing them in the snow here in Southern California for long periods of time. And now what should they be doing? That is really the whole point with long duration autonomy. So the way I'm going to get there is I'm going to, it's basically a story in, in four acts. I want to start by talking about something that we call the Robotarium. Originally built at Georgia Tech, we now have a Robotarium in the ISA building uh, just around the corner here. Then, if you want to understand robots that are out for really long periods of time, why don't we look at other organisms that are out for really long periods of time in habitats? In fact, let's borrow some ideas from ecology. So we're going to talk a little bit about how an ecologist thinks about animal behavior. Then we're going to be technical for a bit uh, and talk about how do we produce behaviors that are consistent with how an ecologist thinks about animals. Uh, we're going to use something called barrier functions to do that. And then at the end, we're going to put robots in the snow in Southern California. So that's the game plan. Cool. So let's go back to this video that I showed. 12 robots shown, there's a lot of stuff that's not shown in this picture. Can you guess what's not shown in this picture? I actually can show you what's not shown. It's this. To run a world-class large-scale robotics lab, it costs a lot of resources, a lot of money. In fact, what's not shown in this video is there's an army of PhD students and postdocs standing around. I have a Vicon motion captioning system for tracking where all the robots are to provide the indoor GPS. There is compute. There's also a lot of time just getting the device drivers up and running. It takes a lot of effort and resources and people to run big multi-robot labs. In fact, has anyone here worked on robots, actual hardware? Two hands in the air. It's really irritating to get one robot to work. Just stuff happens. You're going to multiply that by 12. In fact, you probably have to raise it to the power of 12. How do you even have 12 charged batteries? It turns out that that's not easy. So just scaling up is really painful. Uh, and as a result, there aren't that many multi-robot labs on the planet that really can, can play sharply. Uh, if you go to ICRA or IROS, the big robotics conferences, it's the same handful of labs that are cool, doing the coolest stuff. Not because it's the same handful of labs that have the best ideas. They just happen to have the most resources. And a handful of years ago, I got more and more bothered by this. In fact, I got so bothered by it that I decided that I wanted to do something about it. Uh, 
I don't like it when science in general becomes a competition for who has the most resources. I think it should be a competition for who has the best ideas. And in robotics, this is very true. The other thing that bothered me is if you look at labs everywhere, right? First of all, we all spend time implementing the same things. We're, we're wasting time doing stuff that's already done. The other thing is most labs, and in fact, I looked at my lab at Georgia Tech, which was a really active lab, around 90% of the time, the robots weren't doing anything. And this is a really active lab, right? Because labs aren't utilized typically. And it's also in robotics very hard to compare. If you look at robotics papers, it's here's some algorithm, here's a video or a picture, it's even worse. Uh, of a robot doing something. Yay, success, right? Was this good? Was it good? Better? Was it worse than what's done before? We don't have crisp benchmarks that some of the, like computer vision has a much typically crisper set of benchmarks. We don't have that in robotics to the same degree. So these are other speed bumps. The solution that we came up with is what we call the Robotarium. And the idea was to build a remotely accessible swarm robotics lab. And the National Science Foundation, they have something called an MRI, which is a major research instrumentation grant. We went to NSF and said, we want to build the Robotarium. This is literally the picture that I put in the proposal. It's the Vienna Chamber Orchestra's concert hall. And then I photoshopped these Harvard kilobots on top of it, and then some random graphical stuff in the background. I said, give me money, I'm going to build this. And NSF said, sure, here's the money. This is what I built. <laughs> it's not quite. Uh, this was the first version. Uh, we did build something uh, nice, and we do have a, a, an exact replica of this now in, in ISEB. But I really wanted this lab to look differently because it was going to be a very public-facing lab. Uh, I wanted it to be a little bit like almost a, a cross between a, an Apple store and, and a robotics lab. It had to look sleek. It had to be something where people actually wanted to engage with. So we went live in August 2017. And there are other remotely accessible labs out there. There were other labs out there uh, already in 2017. Not in robotics, certainly not in swarm robotics, but there is a, a long-standing lab at Rutgers focusing on wireless networking. There's a cybersecurity lab at USC. But there have also been a lot of failed labs. And the number one reason remotely accessible labs don't succeed is no one uses them. It's not technical. It's just like, yeah, whatever. I got my own stuff. Why would I use yours? So we spent a lot of time early on drumming up business. I made sure I did media. I begged my best friends to su submit something. Here's the uh, front page of the Wall Street Journal. This robot lab has no idea what its robots are doing, which is absolutely true, because the whole point is you upload code, you run experiments. We don't know what you're doing, but welcome. So. We were very successful early on on getting lots of users, which turned out to not be good at all. Because immediately the following thing started happening. People started breaking stuff. So, you know, on the ground, fine. We also had aerial robots and in the air when stuff breaks, falls down. <laughs> stuff, it's painful, right? Uh, so we had a problem. All of a sudden, we needed people to be able to upload code, this needed to be a research instrument, so you should be allowed to do crazy and bad things, because bad code is also research, right? But at the same time, how do we make sure that stuff doesn't break? This is really the first question that you start studying when you become a roboticist, is how do you make sure that robots don't collide with each other or things in the world? Collision avoidance or obstacle avoidance is how it's normally referred to, and in fact, it is the most canonical robotics problem. How do you avoid collisions, right? And uh, collisions, has, <laughs> they have a long and illustrious history in robotics. This, I think, is the most famous robot collision. Uh, this was in 2007, where DARPA had what they called their urban challenge. This was way before self-driving cars were a thing. And, uh, that is Cornell's self-driving car, and the other car is MIT's self-driving car, colliding with each other, no drivers. We actually wrote a paper. I had a car uh, that also collided with stuff. We wrote a paper uh, with a bunch of different teams, and the big part of the paper is what went wrong during this collision. The point is, collisions are bad. And in 2007, we really didn't know how to deal with them very well. Um, 
I want to show you my car because it was great. We had a Porsche Cayenne, a really nice car. That was, uh, we did really well. We made it to the finals. And then for some reason, we drove straight into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the thing in front that we're using as a bumper, that was a, legal, a Regal laser scanner that cost $200,000 that we're putting the bumper, which may not have been ideal. No. <laughs> Point though is collisions are bad. And in 2007, there were collisions. Uh, one of my big regrets in life is I was right there having the Georgia Tech team. Mm -hmm. On this side was the Carnegie Mellon team. That So the Chris Ermson, who was the, the lead of that team, he went off and founded self-driving car companies. And he now has more money than he knows what to do with. Over there was Stanford's team. Uh, Sebastian Thrun was the lead. He went to found, uh, was the founder of Google X. Uh, so. They all did well. And I'm here lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> the point though is let's fast forward to today. Um, every major car or auto manufacturer is now a self-driving car company. Right? Uh, there are tons of companies that are living at different levels in the autonomy stack. There are communications companies, sensor companies, user interface companies. But self-driving cars still collide. We every now and then get some updates from you know, some car driving into something. Collision avoidance still isn't a fully solved problem. And the reason for that is what in the autonomous driving world, people refer to as the 100 million mile problem. So in the US, there is a fatality in traffic roughly every 100 million mile travel. That translates to around 30,000 deaths in traffic, give or take, every year. So 30,000 people die in traffic in the US every year, which means every 100 million miles. Let's say that tomorrow we all had self-driving cars, and they were twice as good as human drivers, which means that only 15,000 people died in traffic because we went to self-driving cars. The headlines would be, robots kill 15,000 people in traffic. We would not accept that. There's no way people would be okay with 15,000 people being killed by robots in traffic. So let's say they're even, even better, right? Let's say we only murder 3,000 people by robots in traffic every year. People are very, very uncomfortable with that number as well. So technology in this case needs to not only be as good as human drivers, they need to be way better for us to even be okay with what's going on. So the point is, if a human driver has a fatality roughly every 100, uh, 100, thousand million, 100 million miles, self-driving cars have to have one even one less frequently. And every 100 million mile journey contains a lot of weird stuff. There's a lot of stuff. Give me a sec, then I'll, but I'm glad you're raising your hand. There's a lot of weird stuff happening on the road. And just keeping track of everything that's gonna go wrong when you're out on the road is hard. There isn't a sensor on the planet right now that can deal with sleet, for instance. So heavy, snowy rain, right? that's almost impossible to pierce with any sensor. Uh, you have you know, cows and cars going the wrong direction. You have obstacles that don't stick up that are hard to detect with sensors. It's just hard because there's a lot of stuff happening and Part of the reason why self-driving cars aren't quite where we think they should be is we're very good at scenarios that we've studied a lot where there is lots of data. If you're doing self-driving cars in San Francisco, for instance, it's well mapped, you know roughly what's going on, it's fine. But in general, the 100 million mile journeys are long. The point though is it's not a solved problem. That's all I wanted to say. You had a hand in the air. I was just gonna ask like, for the human statistic, like how much of that is like due to say like DUIs and like unoptimal suboptimal behavior versus like non-trivial? Yeah, so so I'm not an exper expert on traffic safety, but what happened is cars got safer and safer. So we saw fatalities drop off for quite a long time in the US. And then all of a sudden they started spiking up again and they went up to higher when they were before we started making the car safe. And what happens there is there are way more single car accidents than what was in, in the past. And what is causing single car accidents? 
right? Mm -hmm. People are texting while driving and people are watching, you know, kittens on YouTube while driving. And and so all of a sudden it's it's absolutely humans are starting to be weirder than we used to be because our attention isn't always on the road anymore. I, I so th there is a very, very crisp curve or increase in the curve that is around the time that everyone had a smartphone. So that's it's 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 plateaued. So you know we're we are where we are now. Uh, the, these statistics are remarkably consistent across across uh, years. Uh, but yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Point though is I, I still made a claim that the obstacle avoidance isn't solved, isn't it though? If you go to Google Scholar and you type in collision avoidance, you get you know seven hundred thousand hits, papers. If you type in obstacle avoidance, you get over a million hits. So clearly. People have thought about it and written papers about it. So in certain senses, it's solved. In the robotarium, though, which is where this all started, it's not solved because here is our problems in the robotarium. First of all, I need a really high robot density. I want robots to be very close together. Because these are robots. They're supposed to be close together. Almost all collision avoidance algorithms out there are something like Let's say I'm a negatively charged particle and so are you, so we're going to repel each other. Typically, you have something like it's one over the distance squared in, in the amplitude of the force. So the closer we get together, the more we're being pushed away, which means that when we're really close together, all we're doing is not colliding, which is not how you get high robot density. That's the first problem, or the first thing that's different with the robot term. I need ro lots of robots. The other thing that's different is if you look at a lot of the literature on collision avoidance, the point is, I should, what's your name? David. David. So I should be safe no matter what you do. That's typically how it's approached. So no matter your behavior, I need to move so that I'm safe. That's extremely conservative. If we can collaborate, which they can do in the robot term, we can actually get much closer. So there is a collaborative aspect. The third thing that's different in the robot terrium is we don't know what the robots are supposed to do because if we know what the objective is, you can actually plan things like I'm supposed to go to that door. We're going to plan our way out of a collision. But if I don't know where we're going, because this is a remotely accessible thing, and I'm going to pick on David again. David uploaded some random code. I don't know what it's supposed to do. Uh, we can't take advantage of prior knowledge of what the high level objective is. So that's another thing that's different. The way we solved it is we introduced a straight up conversation problem that says David is uploading code he's telling the robots to do something we're going to say eh, the robots are going to do something else but we're going to minimize the distance in some sense between what David is saying that the robots should do and what they actually do subject to be safe so we basically add a safety constraint and I'm going to show you what this looks like in, in a sec uh, it's called a barrier certificate and it's become quite Effective. So let me show you how this works. This is how you know that I'm actually on the engineering side because I'm going to write down a differential equation. Uh, this is the robot dynamics. Right? So X sub I is the state, could be the position or the pose, depending on what you're interested in, of robot I. This is where robot I is. And then when you look at dynamics, you always have what's called the drift term. This is, this is what the robot does if nothing is happening. You know, if you take your hands off the steering wheel and uh, the gas and the brake of a car, it keeps gliding. That's the F term. G is the actuator dynamics. This is, if I turn the steering wheel, how does that translate into a change in what the car is doing? And then U is the thing that I am controlling. That's the input. The U sub I is what David is telling robot I to do. That's how you should think about this. And here on the picture, we have two robots. They're on a collision course, but I made the arrows green because it's mathematically possible to avoid a collision. You can do something. So even though you're on a collision course, you're not doomed to collide. So the arrows are green. An alternative way of saying the same thing is let's smoosh all the states together and say, if you're in this lime green set, you're fine. You can do things to avoid a collision. When you're on the boundary of this set, then you have to take corrective action because otherwise the collision is inevitable. And on the outside, it's game over. You may have collided, or at least there's nothing you can do to avoid a collision. Let's say you have two cars driving towards each other quickly. At some point, even though they haven't collided yet, there's nothing you can do. 
So the name of the game is to keep the joint state inside the lime green set. We're going to assume that we can encode this lime green set as a scalar function. And as long as H is positive, you're inside. When H is zero, you're on the boundary. And when H is negative, you're outside. So the name of the game that we're going to play is no matter what we do, H needs to be positive. That's it. So then here is something one could do, which is at each moment in time, David is telling the robotarium, do this. You U is the control input, but we're going to have U sub N for the nominal. It should be U sub D for David. That's what he's telling the robots to do. And we're going to say, eh, almost. Let's be as close as possible in a least square sense. We're going to do U subject to this thing being positive. This looks like a perfectly reasonable problem and a perfectly reasonable approach. However, it is sadly complete nonsense. Can anyone see why, just tell you why it's nonsense. I have a constraint in some variable that I'm calling X, and then I'm minimizing over a decision variable that I'm calling U, and they're not coupled at all. This is, this is, this is just, this is nonsense. What I need to do is I need to connect X to U, and the only way to do that is through the dynamics that says, this is how U affects X. So this doesn't work. I need a constraint that involves you. So I'm going to show you this key result in uh, the control barrier function uh, literature. Um, so we want to stay inside this set. We want H to always be positive. H is a scalar. So let's pretend that if somehow by magic, we could drive H down asymptotically to zero. Let's pretend that we could. And for those of you who have taken differential equations, this could be h dot is negative h would be something. The point is that there is a class of functions that will drive h asymptotically down to zero. This, this just says, what if by magic or some other method I could do that? Then I would get the red curve. So it's possible to pick something to get the red curve. Eh, why would I want to drive this to zero? Well, there's something called the comparison lemma that just says, what if instead h dot, the dynamics of h, is greater than or equal to this thing, then the green curve is going to be greater than or equal to the red curve, that is always going to be greater than or equal to zero. Asymptotically, it's going to go to zero, but that means green curve is always greater than or equal to zero. So that is a constraint. So the, the key result here, the theorem that says the safe set, the yellow set, is forward invariant, which is a fancy way of saying, if I start in this set, which is where we were safe, if I start safe, forward invariant says, if I start safe, then I stay safe forever. So it's forward invariant. If the control input, U satisfies this green curve. So that's the constraint. And this is how you get the dynamics into the constraint. And now we have an optimization problem that actually makes sense. And this thing is known as a barrier certificate. And it looks complicated. I'm going to show you why it's not. So H dot, for those of you who remain your chain rule, this is the time derivative of H, which is the inner product between the gradient of H and the dynamics. Fine. I'm just doing a little bit of algebra here. I can move things over on different sides. The point is, all I'm left with is something messy and complicated in X which we assume we measure, times u greater than or equal to something messy involving x. u is our decision variable. This is a linear constraint. This is actually really simple, even though there's messy stuff, but that's, that's based on models and things we measure. The only thing that we have to decide is u. So now what we have is this. We want to minimize u minus u David squared subject to this thing. This is a quadratic programming problem. This is something we can solve blazingly fast for collision avoidance. We can even do it in a distributed manner. So I saw my part, you saw your part. So this is how we're going to run safety in, in the robotarium. And the theorem says if the input satisfies the constraint, then if the robots start safe, they stay safe. So as long you can do whatever you want as long as we satisfy this constraint. 
So let me show you what this looks like. So this video that I showed of two robots or four robots colliding, this was actually us telling the robots, go through the same point in the middle in order to swap positions, which is a car crash. And now here is what the constraint does. We're not telling the robots at all what to do. We're just saying, subject to this barrier constraint that we have. And what I like about it is it looks right. A lot of robotics, you look and you go, yeah, sure, it works, but it doesn't feel right. This feels right. And things like traffic circles emerge naturally. But the point is that anything interesting we're seeing here is a function of a constraint, not a, an objective. And that, to me, becomes quite, quite powerful. Uh, guaranteed to be safe. It's also guaranteed to be safe if one robot is misbehaving. So here, you have a big robot that doesn't play along at all. And these, these small robots have to run, 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 run. <laughs> so. We even put this in the air. So let me show you what this looks like in the air. Uh, so quads are extra complicated because it's not only collisions, because if one quad drives over another, then the lower one's airflow is messed up and it falls out of the air. But what we're going to see here is Four of them are driving in a circle, and the fifth one is controlled by a former student of mine who's now uh, an autopilot engineer at Tesla, by the way. Uh, and he's trying to make this quad collide with the ones that are spiraling, and he can't because of the barrier uh, constraint. Um, this becomes quite powerful. We've done it with things like safe learning, where the robots are learning stuff, but how do you ensure that you're safe while learning? Well, you wrap these things around, around the robots. And in the Robotarium, this is what it looks like. So when you upload code now in the Robotarium, uh, if you can't convince us that you know what you're doing, we have this safety thing running around it. So this is what the same problem looks like when we're spreading out all the robots in a circle, have them go through exactly the same point in the middle to swap positions. It is a massive robotic car crash in the making. And look how dense this is. This is this is better than anything out there in terms of just being able to pack robots densely together without pre-planning trajectories. If you pre-plan things, you could do this. But here, the constraint is kicking in uh, to, to make, them, make them safe. So we have a way of ensuring safety in the robotarium. And in fact, we yes. So in that example, is each robot kind of essentially its own feedback control policy of, to try to yeah. do a target? Yes. So what the, what they're doing is we're there. You and I, I'm getting as a robot. I get your initial condition as my target, and I go towards it. You get mine, and then we're so that's so that's how they're yeah. As their controls are perturbed and exactly. it's perturbed, that's exactly. how they know how to crack. There's one point that you're implicitly making, or even if you aren't, maybe you should, uh, which is it's actually possible that we end up in a deadlock situation. It's in this case of you you can perturb it out, but there's no guarantee that any task is actually achieve, the only thing that's guaranteed is safety. So you can end up in deadlock situations. Uh, then you have to deal with that in other ways. But in this case, the world is not perfect. So any little tiny perturbation is enough to nudge you out of the, but that's a good point. Uh, so we went live in 2017. Uh, to date, this is, this is a few months old, but we have over 700 labs, labs that are using it. Uh, you need to register as a user. We accept everyone, but we have close now to 5,000 registered users, uh, 7,500 experiments. We don't know how many papers people are writing using the Robotarium. We're asking them to reference this one paper if they publish something using the Robotarium for us to keep track, and it's around 250 or so. If you go to ICRA or IROS, you will see uh, experiments on the Robotarium. But the most important thing for me is, if you look at where the users are, well, the vast majority are North America, but we have labs in Asia, of course, in Europe, but then we have quite a few labs in South America. So these are labs in South America, and then four labs in Africa that are actually using the Robotarium. And our ambition was to democratize access. I think in many ways, this is what success looks like in my mind, that we've actually, we have reached all continents except Antarctica. So my ask of you is when you graduate and you become professors at the University of Antarctica, 
<laughs> Please run experiments on the Robotarium so, so I can say we have every uh, every continent represented. But that, that I mean, this this plot makes me feel good. Uh, other surprising things happen, like. There is a robotics lab at Tokyo Tech. They started running coordinated experiments at the Robotarium and at Tokyo Tech. So this is 11,000 kilometers, 400 millisecond round trip delay. How do you coordinate robots across really vast distances? There are new Robotariums that have cropped up. This is the Ducky Town Robotarium at ETH in, in Zurich. Uh, so there is a Robotarium Paraguay. There is a Robotarium at Oregon State. So there are more Robotariums now that exist uh, based on this architecture, which makes me very, very excited. So that's the Robotarium. Now you're all wondering, what does this have to do with robots in the snow for long periods of time? That's what you should be worth wondering, because that's what this talk is about, right? Uh, one of the things that the world of swarm robotics has benefited gre greatly from is collaboration with biologists. We've learned a lot about how to coordinate robots based on how fish, for instance, coordinate their activities. So why don't we, if we want to understand what robots do in the snow, look at things that are actually out in the snow. So let's ask, what, 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 what do animals do? <coughs> what does the Arctic fox do? Or what do elephants do, right? What, what, are, what do they do? And here is a paper that you should all have read if you're a roboticist. Uh, this is Rodney Brooks, uh, one uh, arguably the most famous roboticist on the planet. Uh, he used to be a professor at MIT. Now he's just starting a bunch of companies. iRobot, you may have heard of. I mean, but he, he's a deep thinker. Uh, and in 1990, he wrote this paper called Elephants Don't Play Chess. They don't, right? But they're really good at being elephants. And they're really good at even when they're born, they don't immediately get eaten by jaguars or lions, right? So elephants are really good at surviving. And then, sure, you can learn how to play chess after a while, but that can't be the first order of business. So one can ask, of course, if elephants don't play chess, what do they do? Well, I don't really know what they do quite yet, but there was a paper written by Mark Steinberg in 2016. He's a, he's a program manager at the Office of Naval Research, where he laid out this whole idea with long duration economy. And he made three observations that I think are worth thinking about. Uh, the first is, and this goes back to the 100 million mile problem, any attempt at enumerating everything that you're going to experience when you're out for long periods of time is not going to work. You can't, because of the combinatorics of the real world, you can't enumerate here are the 400 things that the robot will experience. And the reason I have this picture here of a robot swan is I actually worked with a roboticist in, in Metz in France where we're putting uh, these robotic boats on the canals in, in France. And this one robot always got stuck in this one location and we couldn't figure out what was going on. So we went to actually inspect what was going on and it turns out that it was a nesting swan there, uh, uh, actually a swan pair. And as you may know, swans can get quite aggressive when they have kids. So when this robot would come, the swans would attack. This poor robot is trying to do obstacle avoidance is beached up on the side of the river to avoid this attacking swan. It's very hard to figure out that you're gonna to have to be a swan-proof robot. So this is an example of things that we didn't think about when we deployed the robot. Stuff happens. The other thing is, sadly, the only way to understand systems that can be deployed over long periods of time is to deploy systems over long periods of time. You gotta be out there in the world. You can maybe try to do it in simulation nowadays where we have really high fidelity engines, but but in general, you can't do long duration autonomy over five minutes in a lab. You've got to be out there. And then the last point, which I think is the most important point, is optimality is irrelevant. If you look at how animals move, if you look at how humans move, there's nothing optimal about us. We're not energy minimizers. We don't travel the shortest distance. I use my hands a lot when I talk. That's a horrible waste of energy, right? But what we are good at is surviving. Right? If, if you think about something like walking, walking is miraculous. We're basically an inverted pendulum that someone manages not to fall over and we walk on grass, on rubble, we walk upstairs. Some people can walk with high heels. This is hard and we can do, we're not optimal, 
but we're resilient and we're adaptive to different surfaces. So this idea of survival being more important than optimality is really key. So we're going to understand foxes. Let's focus in on this idea of, of survival, which takes me to the next part, which is, let me tell you a little bit about ecology. I have collaborated quite a bit with ecologists. I now give talks at ecology conferences. I am not an ecologist, so I want to tell you that. So when I say things that are wrong, you can go, okay, it's because he's not an ecologist. But let's, let's pretend that we're ecologists and, and think like ecologists and build an animal. We're going to build an animal now. And for some reason, we're going to build what's called a folivore, a leaf-eating animal. Leaves are really bad foods. Leaves are structurally protected. They have all these weird fibers in them. A lot of times they're toxically protected. I mean, plants don't want you to eat their leaves. They have you know, nuts and fruits for that. Leaves are really there to capture sun energy, right? So, so it's hard to eat leaves. And animals that are folivores, they have to have a big enough gut, a long digestive tract to break down this horrible food. You know, elements, uh, elephants and giraffes. Cows have multiple stomachs because they need to break down this this terrible food that they're living on. So if you're gonna build a folivore, you gotta build a big animal because that's what it takes to break down this food. But for some reason, we also want to build an arboreal, which is code for a tree dwelling animal. So we want an animal that lives in trees. Elephants, well, they don't play chess. They also don't climb trees, right? Because they're too big, they would fall out. Animals that live in trees all their lives are small because that's the only way to survive successfully up amongst the, the branches. Uh, so we want to be, make a big animal that eats leaves, but a small animal that lives in trees. It turns out nature has solved that, but not that frequently. There are only a handful of arboreal folivore mammals. Here are three of them. This is the, the three-toed sloth. Another example is the two-toed sloth. Uh, if you've seen these cute sloths on YouTube, that's the two-toed. The three-toed is, is kind of nasty. It has this weird algae on its fur. It's, it's not at all as cute. This is a slow loris. This is a koala. There are a few lemurs that also fall in this category. They're all the same size, more or less, three to seven pounds. Yay, hi. And they also all have another thing in common, which is they don't do anything because they're living extraordinarily energy-starved lives. And when I started thinking about, I want to deploy robots for long periods of time, they need to be hyper energy efficient. Let me study and learn something about these animals as a source of inspiration. So I started reading, I got particularly excited about sloths, partially because I went to Costa Rica and I thought sloths were awesome. Uh, so the three-toed sloth, the, the lazy version of the sloth, the two-toed, it, it can move around. The three-toed would spend its entire life in one to two trees. It's an extraordinarily slow and lonely sloth. It just sits there, barely surviving. And then every now and then, roughly every two weeks, the sloth will, I don't know if you've read this, but it will climb down the tree in order to go to the bathroom and climb back up. I read this paper about it, and they were talking about how this is by far the most energetically costly thing the sloth will do. It was described as running a marathon in order to go to the bathroom. It's also by far the most dangerous thing the sloth will do. So this is, the paper said, this is like running a marathon while being attacked in order to go to the bathroom. That seemed weird. So I got, you know, why is this? Uh, I, I decided I need professional help. So I randomly emailed, I Googled sloth ecologist. I found this guy at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we started working together. And I asked him, why does the sloth want to climb down the tree to go to the bathroom? And he said, that is the wrong question. An ecologist never asks, why does an animal want to do something? An ecologist asks, what are, they call them ecological pressures or constraints imposed on the animal by the environment that makes this behavior emerge? So constraints are, availability of food, mates, shade, predators. These are all pressures or constraints imposed on the robot, sorry, on the, on the animal. So I started talking more and more to John and realized, aha, this is 
what life out in nature is all about. It's do nothing subject to don't die. This is extreme existential nihilism. Life is meaningless. You should sit on the couch, do nothing, except every now and then go get a snack. <laughs> maybe go to the bathroom, right? Uh, so John looked at it and went, oh, okay, yeah, fine, maybe. And I, this is one of the things I, I talk about at ecology conferences. And ecologists, they cringe a little bit, but uh, they're largely okay with it. So why don't we embrace this and say, you know what? Let's tell this robot to do nothing. Don't do anything. Subject to don't die. We got to figure out what don't die means, right? But because then there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, but that's what we're going to tell this robot. And the nice thing is, the reason I talked about the robotarium was it was minimize the difference between what David is telling the robots to do and what they're actually doing, subject to don't collide. So we have the embryo of a framework for describing something like this in a tight way. The problem is don't die is a pretty complicated thing. So what we need to do is we need to be able to combine a lot of these different constraints or the barrier functions that we call them in a way that makes mathematical sense. So here's where we left off. We said what we want to do is we want to minimize u minus u nominal squared. If we tell them to do nothing, u nominal is zero. So we're just minimizing u squared subject to this constraint. And the nice thing is this, is this we can solve in real time. It's QP, it's easy. There are a few drawbacks though. One is this idea of forward invariance. If you start safe, you stay safe. Only if solutions exist. There's no guarantee that solutions exist. So there is a statement and I was very clear about, I made it on purpose to say, if you satisfies this, then the system is safe. It doesn't guarantee that there will be a solution. So keep that in mind. We already said there's no notion of, of deadlock avoidance, task completion, because there's really no notion of task at all. Safety is all there is. And then we had this H of X greater than or equal to zero. It's a just scalar, actually continuously differentiable function. It's don't die a scalar differentiable function. Probably not, we need to combine things. So let's talk about that. Uh, we're gonna do Boolean composition. So let's say that you have the green set. You want H1 to be greater than equal to zero and the yellow set says H2 greater than equal to zero. If you do the and, it's a conjunction, right? Uh, set theoretically, if you wanna be in C1 and in C2, that's, that's just the intersection. So set theoretically, this is uncomplicated, right? Uh, Similarly, this junction or or is the union. So from a set theoretic point of view, these are trivial operations. The problem is, again, we need scalar functions to encode this. So how do we go from unions and intersections to things that actually we can deal with in a barrier function? So that's the problem. But let's say that I want H1 to be positive and I want H2 to be positive. That's equivalent to saying that the smallest of the two is positive. So and conjunction is the min operator. That's it. So h1 greater than equal to zero and h2 greater than equal to zero is equivalent to saying that the smallest of the two is greater than equal to zero. Now you're all going to be shocked when I say that h1 needs to be greater than equal to zero or h2 needs to be greater than equal to zero. That's equivalent to saying that the biggest of the two needs to be greater than equal to zero. That's it. So this junction is simply a max operator. So now I can start combining things together through these min and max operators and get to full Boolean composition. Uh, you know, you get negation. The one thing that you have to be technical about that I'm not gonna do here is min and max are non-smooth operators. So you can't always take derivatives. You have to figure out how to deal with that, but you can solve that. So that's a, that's a sidebar. The point though is that we can now do Boolean composition of these constraints using min and max operators. So here's an example. Oh, excellent. Here's an example where I have four robots. I have a blue robot, a green robot, a red robot, and a yellow robot. And the green robot has some path it's want to take encoded through the green control signal. And it needs to be safe, meaning it can't be too close to any other robot. And 
it needs to be connected to the blue robot and connected means close enough. So green can, can't be too close to any robot and it needs to be connected to the blue robot. The blue robot has to be safe and connected to the green robot. This is what's called the backbone. So no matter what, blue and green can't be too far away. The red robot has to be safe and connected to the blue robot or connected to the green robot. And similar to the yellow one. So it has to be connected to the backbone. It doesn't matter where it is. This is a fairly complicated set of instructions. And this is what it looks like. I mean, I think this is remarkable. So this is the path. These are the nominal trajectories. The, the thick red here is blue and green. And now they're moving around, making sure that blue and green always is contained, um, connected. Uh, the other two robots are always connected to the assembly, but it doesn't matter where, and they never get too close. This is pretty complex robot behavior right here. People write papers about connectivity preserving collision avoidance in distributed systems. We just wrote down a constraint. In fact, this is the, the robotic equivalence of climbing down a tree to go to the bathroom, right? It's, it's surprisingly complicated, and it's entirely driven by a set of constraints. So we now have a way of actually combining things together. So let's put robots in the snow. And uh, the reason I very much care about this problem is I got to this point where I've done a lot of robotics, done a lot of different applications, and I got more and more drawn to what I consider the only problem really worth solving, which is the climate problem. So can I use my robots for good in that sense? And in particular, for the purpose of environmental monitoring, can I use the robots to get out there to measure things in the world that are of use to climate scientists? Uh, if you think of the Mars rovers, actually Mars is a, Mars is a planet populated by robots. It actually is. When you think of it, there are robots. The, the only thing living on Mars are robots. You know, Spirit and Opportunity were these remarkable robots. Uh, Opportunity was functional for 17 years. That's absolutely mind-blowing. But they, they were environmental monitoring robots. Uh, I've done work down in the, the polar ice shelves uh, before the Robotarium, sadly. But, but anyway, the, there is a lot of, I think, interest in using robots to know what's going on in the environment. That's why I care deeply about this problem. It's closely related to something called precision ag. The number one commercial driver of autonomous vehicles right now is actually agriculture. There are tons of autonomous robots out on farm fields tending to individual plants. So instead of carpet bombing a field with water or pesticide or fertilizers, you can actually have robots be out there for long periods of time working with individual with individual plants. You have robots that are shaking fruit trees to get fruit down. Uh, in Georgia, there's a lot of blueberry uh, farming and blueberries are very susceptible to pests. So they have to spray them with different things at different moments in time. When you've sprayed a blueberry farm, people aren't allowed to be there for a few days. So they actually all have robots there because it's dangerous for humans to, to be out there. Think about this next time you eat blueberries. Uh, Point though is that precision ag is very close to environmental monitoring. So let's do environmental monitoring. And we know that we're gonna tell the robots to do nothing subject to don't die. I'm gonna draw a little bit more inspiration from nature just because I like. Uh, this is a collection of lion prides in Tanzania. And they spread out in such a way that each pride, each group of lions has enough food, enough water. So basically they spread out to have what's called a region of dominance. Uh, the reason I'm showing the zebras is there's something known as a selfish herd, where it turns out that the, the optimal way to act as an individual zebra in order to not get eaten is to have align yourself to your neighbor so you have, you have your own region and you get basically what's called a Voronoi tessellation, where uh, each zebra should be what's called uh, the center or the seed of what's called the centroidal Voronoi tessellation. The point, though, is that you should move in such a way that you have your own region of dominance. So what we're going to do is every node that's out there, don't die is going to mean you have to have a big enough region that you're in charge of to survive. Also, don't drive into things and some other things. So here's how we're encoding don't die. Don't collide with other robots or stuff in the environment and, which we now know is the min operator, always have enough energy to return to a 
charging station. This could be a sunny spot. You shouldn't be with solar panels in a cave somewhere and run out of batteries. And cover a sufficiently big area. So have enough to eat. In this case, it's measuring, perhaps if you're monitoring things, or charge the batteries. So min, 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 max. That's, that's all that is. So that's how we're encoding it. And we put it in the old robotarium. Uh, so what you're gonna, these robots are told literally do nothing subject to this survival constraint. And we're gonna have to speed up time because most of the time these robots do absolutely nothing. So they're spreading out because they now need to eat or be in charge of a big enough area. Now we're gonna speed up time a lot. And then after a while, one of them, I think it's the fourth quadrant robot is gonna have to go to the charging station, which is this strip over there to recharge. Uh, Again, entirely constraint driven. We're literally telling min u squared. So min, a, don't move. Uh, collision avoidance is pushing this out of the way. It's recharging and so forth. Uh, so now we have this rich behavior emerging as a consequence of, of the survival constraint. In fact, if you look at the battery levels, uh, this in this case is the voltages, they are always within uh, the prescribed limits. So that's how we do it. Now, Let's put this on some sloths. We started with sloths, let's build sloth robots. I got very fascinated by tree canopies. It turns out we know very little about what's going on under the tree canopies down in, in rainforest in, in South America. It's hard to get there, it's hard to get persistent measurements, in part because it's not particularly sunny, so anything that revolves around solar panels is gonna run out of steam, which is why you need to be able to move out from under the tree canopies every now and then recharge and then move back in. So mobility is key. We ended up using wire traversing robots, partially because slots run on wires. So this was an early uh, early version of something that we call the sloth bot, trying to make sure that it could climb up and down properly. Uh, this particular one ended up not being the, the, the final design we went with for Miscellaneous reasons. Uh, yeah, we broke. That was it. Uh, point though is we built the sloth bot. And I don't know if you can see it. You should Google sloth bot if you feel like it. Uh, we deployed it first in the Atlanta Botanical Garden because this was initially done when I was at Georgia Tech. It was there for over a year, uh, just being amongst the treetops. IEEE, they have a global ranking of robots. And last week, the sloth bot was ranked number 13 in the world in terms of popular robots. And it's so weird. I've spent my entire career building robots that do things. And then when I build a robot that doesn't do anything, <laughs> the world likes it. And partially because it's, it's, it's cute. In fact, I've gotten really excited about this idea of approaching a lot of robotics using ecological principles. My pandemic project was writing this book on robot ecology, where we revisited a lot of robotics, not from a goal point of view, but from a constraint point of view. Can we recover and can we do other things by only talking about survival rather than, than optimality? The point though I wanna make, and I'm almost done, I uh, apologize that I'm going a few minutes over, is the sloth bot is actually coming to a beach near you in the not too distant future. We have an agreement with, does anyone know where this is? Crystal Cove. This is Crystal Cove. So we're gonna put, so there they're very interested in, uh, in sand loss um, and beach erosion, and they wanna measure what's happening to the beach over time. So we're gonna put the robots up on the cliffs, the cliff sides, if you know what Crystal Cove looks like, to basically look at the beach. Uh, we have permission to do it, and then the Crystal Cove Conservancy said, yeah, you know what, sloths aren't indigenous to South, Southern California. Can we do something else? So talk to them and we discussed and we actually, but we still need them to kind of climb on things. So we converged on the raccoon bot. <laughs> and literally two weeks ago, we submitted a paper to IROS. Efren, are you here? Yeah, Efren back. he's the builder of this thing. This is the raccoon bot, the first test in Aldridge Park. It looks kind of like a raccoon. My daughters think that its hands are a little creepy, but uh, everything is, else is good. So this is this is hot off the presses. This just was wrapped up a few weeks ago, and 
we're, we're now at permission to put it in the ecological preserve. So that's where it's going first. And then it's going to go down to the beach in, uh, in Crystal Cove this, this summer. So with that, I want to say thank you. Uh, different pieces to this talk, right? So I think the Robotarium is, is an interesting idea. If you have, if you want to try something, you should go to the Robotarium and try it because it's actually kind of fun to run experiments. Uh, even if you didn't like the Robotarium, this idea of thinking about behavior through constraints, I think is very powerful. And I think it's powerful. I also think it's natural. If you want to minimize this and minimize that, there is no canonically correct way of combining costs. Do you add them together? Do you have sigma one times this plus sigma two times that? Do you multiply them? Do you take the logarithm of that? Or do you do a multi objective optimization problem and you get one of these Pareto optimal fronts, well, you're going to have to decide where on the front you are, which is a, an arbitrary decision. There's something arbitrary about combining costs. There's nothing arbitrary about combining constraints because if you want an award, it's a union. If you want an and, it's an intersection. There's no argument about that. So I actually like this idea of, of talking about constraints uh, just because there's something canonically correct about it. Uh, I should also point out that anything exciting that you saw here uh, was done by lab members or, or collaborators. Uh, particularly want to point out Agathon, who is an undergrad in the lab and a CS major. So uh, see Agathon, but he's, uh, he was actually the reason that I realized that I wanted a CS appointment because I'm already working with, with CS uh, students. So if there's anything you enjoyed with this talk, uh, it's due to someone on this slide. There were things you didn't like. I suggest we blame Roy for inviting me to come give a talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Do you have an anteater box? No, I don't. <laughs> uh, that was the obvious solution, right? Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> The reason we ended up going wire traversing, hanging on wires, is if you're on the ground and you're going to be out there for really long periods of time, locomotion becomes a thing and you get stuck in mud. Or So we needed some safe way to be able to move a lot. So we needed the wires. Anteaters don't climb. They, they don't. Guess. So, <laughs> so it just didn't fit. But yeah, we should have. Um, so one thing I noticed is that you need um, your dynamics. Yep. And I'm wondering sort of how do you, um, um, th does it have to be locally sort of, at least locally accurate and locally robust? Is there some way to deal with like unknown scenarios? Like like someone left a rake in the middle of a field and it is a part of your dynamics. And yeah. like, and a start. So, so this is a really good point. So th this whole idea of barrier functions involves writing down the dynamics, as you point out. Uh, the dynamics are there always so that we can make predictions into the future in some way. It's, it's a model that allows us to say something about what the future holds. It doesn't have to be a differential equation. There can be other ways of predicting, if I do this, this is what happens. And so, you know, more data-driven approaches. But you still need some notion of what happens if you do this. Uh, the point with the rake is that's something that you're measuring and now you're having a constraint to take take it around take it around it but if you don't see the rake and it's not part of your dynamics then you collide with the rake but it, the point is well made that this is model based it doesn't have to be an ordinary differential equation but there has to be some way of relating the effect that the input has on the state of the system given where you know, the field has gone, there are ways of learning this rather than maybe writing down exactly what the differential equations are. We did it quite a bit in the air where we had, we understand the Euler Lagrange, which is the first thing you learn in mechanical engineering. I don't understand aerodynamics. So we flew quadcopters through one of these uh, bladeless fans. So it flew around it and then we turned on the fan and now we were supposed to fly through it, it would just fall out of the air. So we had to learn the effect of the aerodynamics by building up a model. And what we did is we made the constraints very conservative in the beginning. And then we started expanding the constraints as we learned more about the model. But, but yeah, you, you need some way of predicting what u does to x. I like differential equations, but you don't always have them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
can be question is related, but I guess you need some sort of uh, global information, right, for the collision avoidance, like the position of the you know, in the system. So, so what you need is you need the position. So you can actually compute when a collision can happen or not. So what you need is I need to know where you are relative to me if you're close enough. You need to make a fair assumption in the real world, like in the speed. You so certainly don't need to know everyone, right? Uh, and I certainly don't need to know where you are. I only need to know where you are relative to me. So the vector from me to you, I need to know. Is that a fair assumption? Probably not. Uh, I think in traffic, it's a fair assumption. If you're looking at people bumping into each other in a subway station, it's probably not a fair assumption. Uh, so it is a good problem. Uh, so here's what people talk about in general in, in distributed robotics or swarm robotics. You, you talk about distributed algorithms and decentralized algorithms, and we need both. So distributed algorithm, that, that is really a statement about local, sorry, it's a statement about scalable algorithms. The information needs to, statement about local algorithms you can only act on information that you have locally available to you so there has to be some way in which information is flowing you can all tell each other what your birthday is and then you tell your neighbors about your and your neighbor's birthday and then after a while everyone has a long list of everyone else's birthdays that is what's called a local algorithm because you're only talking to your neighbor but it's still centralized because you're acting on all the information so it's not scalable and you need both you need both the distributed and the decentralized aspect for it to be properly a swarm robotics algorithm. So in this case, local means if you're close enough, we assume that we know we are where we are relative to each other. That may or may not be a, it's not always a fair assumption, but in some scenarios there are. By the way, you're asking the right questions because anytime something seems too good to be true, it probably is. There are always reasons why things aren't as great as when we present them. So we've just discovered two. You need a model and you need to know where other people are. Yes. Yes. Uh, so as a follow-up to his question, um, so as you said, the, the what needs to know initially where it, where it is, right? So the, it becomes sort of a localization problem initially. So uh, what kind of localization algorithm are you using here to kind of... Yeah, so they, so I, I'm the, they don't need to know at all where they are. The only thing they need to know is where where you are relative to me. So I don't, we, we can disagree on, I, we can think that we're in Europe. It doesn't matter. I just need to know this vector from me to you. So in this case, we're not doing localization at all. So uh, just the collision avoidance. Yeah, for that, it. right? But, and the point with the Robotarium, if I start there, there the point is people have run various SLAM algorithms and various localization algorithms. We've kept track of the types of algorithms people are testing. The point is that that's just a, that's just a bucket that you can put your algorithm in and test it. So for the collision avoidance, you don't need any localization. For this sloth bot, it actually builds a model over time of where sunshine is. So there it needs to know where on the wire it is. Uh, doesn't need to know where the wire is, but it needs to know where on the wire. So it's pretty lightweight. So it's lightweight. And in fact, it's, it's the most lightweight you can because this is just a scalar thing too also. Um, as you said, if the robots st start at the safe state, it will remain in the safe state. What if, what if they start in an unsafe state? Is there a best strategy to stay alive? Okay, so, so that's an interesting question, right? The, and there's another variation on that question, which is if you pick you such that this constraint is satisfied, then the safe set is forward invariant. What if no you exists? So what if you end up with a situation where all of a sudden solutions fail to exist? That can happen, especially when you start combining things together. How do you deal with it? The way I think about it is, if you look at constraints, I think there is a there are constraints that are absolutely critical. If you if you if you mess with them, it's game over. But then there are constraints that are nice to have, right? In fact, I've started to be more okay with collisions because people bump into each other all the time. Birds, they're actually their wings touch each other. Uh, but rarely do people run head first into each other. So, so there, not all collisions are bad. Uh, not all constraints have to be satisfied at all moments in time. So the way I think about it and the way I approach it, but this is a little arbitrary, is I have a uh, hierarchy of constraints. And when all of a sudden constraints aren't satisfied or I can't find a solution or I start outside the safe set, I start peeling back constraints in the order of how unimportant they are. And I think that's the, that's the right thing, the right way to think about it. And ultimately, 
you know, if you look at the Mars rovers, which are, are beautiful examples of, of robots that survive way longer than expected, there, whenever there when in doubt, do nothing. So that is the ultimate constraint, which is if everything fail, else fails, just, just stop. But this is an open question, right? How do you deal with it? And, and one way to do it is to peel back constraints in some order that some, in this case, me decided was a good order. Um, yeah, I was just curious to know so about how long does the raccoon robots, like they do in the air, and does the environment um, have an impact on, on the, the life? Cycle. Yeah, so uh, the raccoon bot is new, so it hasn't been out long, but the one, the sloth bot that we put in the Botanica Garden in Atlanta was out for a year and a half. And it failed at one point during this, this uh, deployment. And the reason it failed was there are these nasty yellow pollens that fall from some of the trees that fell and completely covered the solar panels. We didn't predict that. <laughs> so the environment matters. And this is another, I thought that was a, in some sense, a success story because we'd built this hyper safe, survive at all costs, and then something happened that we didn't predict anyway. So yes, is the answer. I think uh, what, what you really need to do is also have a, you need to really learn over time what's happening in the environment on top of this. And it's it's a good point. Even, even when we, we built the world's most fail safe, Hyper efficient robot that failed because we forgot about pollen, it's yellow stuff that just covered the solar panels. Which is why by one of the Mars rovers failed too, because there were sandstorms on Mars that covered their solar panels with sand. So the like in the new robot area or robot thing, like robot thing. Yeah. Uh <laughs> do, do there needs to be some sort of shared objective. Like there needs to be some understanding of the other robot objectives, right? So no, in fact, the whole point is we're just minimize, all we're doing is minim individual robots are minimizing the square of what it's doing and what it's supposed to be doing, subject to this don't collide constraint, which you can compute locally. And what it's supposed to be doing is the instantaneous control signal that's provided by David. So the, the, the whole point there is that we don't have a shared understanding and shared objective. If we do, then you can actually start planning your way out of collisions. Right, right. Sorry, I meant like shared like state. So the shared states I need in as much as I need to know where you are relative to me. Okay. So that's the shared state I need. If you if you're running, but but we, we do provide a shared state. If you want to run an experiment that requires global information, we provide it. We have so what we do, we have a motion capturing system. You maybe you saw that there were little we are gray dots on top of the robots that those are mocap dots and they're all individually configured so that the motion capture system can look at it and go, this configuration is robot one, this configuration is robot two. So we can provide it, but we don't need it for, for collision avoidance. Okay. So you just use like a, like a sensor or something. Yeah. Right. Okay. Got it. Actually, in Robotarium, what we use is we hallucinate that particular sensor. Oh, so okay. there's, a, so we, we, we just, we, built that algorithm at, so we're basically having a central computer tell the robot, this is what you what you would see if you had an ultrasonic sensor or an IR sensor or a laser scanner. And I guess like the other, so my follow-up is just very quickly, like how, how well, how chaotic is this? Like in terms of perturbations to like uh, reality versus what it thinks is going on. Because if you have like a, like a God sensor type thing, like what, like that's not, um, what might happen in like, like an actual sort of situation, right? Yeah, so, so I think it's important in general to know what it is that you're testing. And what we decided in the Robotarium to test were mobility strategies. We're, it's not a place where we have, where you test communication channels. It's not a place where you test state-of-the-art sensors, right? So that's, that's not what it was designed to do. Uh, so, what it is, is it's one step up from simulation in that you actually have hardware moving around and stuff still happens in hardware that you didn't predict in, in simulation. So that's, I, I wanna say that, that there, are, there are layers of what happens to real systems and you gotta figure out what you mean by that. What we meant by real is the mobility is real, the rest is maybe simulated or hallucinated. Uh, how chaotic is it? 
it really depends on what the objectives are, right? I mean, any distributed system is going to be at the mercy of what's going on in the world. And you can have local perturbations that make what you expected it to do not be what it did. To me, that's an example that your algorithm is wrong. Right? Because if the algorithm is that sensitive, then you should probably go and redesign it. So sometimes very chaotic, sometimes, it, I mean, if all you're doing, again, forming circles, right? We know exactly how to do that. There's no chaos involved in that. But covering an area, using some kind of coverage control algorithm, there you can get very strange configurations based, for instance, on initial conditions. All right, thank you. All right, cool. Great, thank you. Thank Let's you. Uh, thank Magnus again. Thank you.